percent. Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 85. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Dan Thoreau of Space Biff. In my estimation, the best games reviewer out there right now. So I'm super excited Whoa. for uh, this podcast. I've been I've been meaning to ask you to come on for a while, and I, I figured this would be a good time uh, since I saw some rumblings about you know board game reviewing and board game criticism, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. So thank you so much, Dan, for coming on the show. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Like I said, I I love your reviews. I think they're awesome. I love the the historical stuff you've been doing. Uh, your your comparison of like the two different versions of Pax Pamir was super super interesting. If if anyone listening hasn't read that yet, they should go do so. I, it's really fascinating. And I'm not even a big history person, uh, but uh, I, I think your, your writing's really awesome. Uh, so the topic today that I want to bring you on uh, to discuss is board game reviewing, board game criticism itself, and. I don't think I've ever had that as a major topic of this podcast before, even though I do discuss it quite a bit, uh, but usually in other contexts. So I suppose my first question for you, Dan, then is how did you get started in doing this, in writing board game criticism? That's a good question. Um, Sometimes I ask myself the same thing. It's one of those things where you wake up in the morning and you say, how did I get here? Why am I me and not someone else? So for me, it was, uh, I, I've been writing my site for a few years now, probably eight or nine. And um, at, at the beginning, it was just that there nobody was writing the sort of thing that I wanted to read. Um, and that isn't to say that there wasn't good stuff being done. You know, at that time, we had like Rab Florence was doing Cardboard Children um, on rock, paper, shotgun and shut up and sit down had been around for a little while. So there were a few people out there that were, they were creating at least a body of people talking about board games in a way that interested me, but just personally, it was not the sort of, it was just not the critique that I wanted personally. And I tend to have the attitude that no one's going to save you. You've got to save yourself. So I, I figured I would start writing it kind of just to keep up the practice of writing. Uh, I enjoy writing quite a bit for me. The hobby is writing about board games, not just playing them. So I started writing about board games and like a lot of other people early on, I feel like a lot of my early reviews, I've had a conundrum where do I link them or not? If I reference them in a new review, generally I don't nowadays because I look back and some of them are a little formulaic where I'm like, well, let's talk about the actions and, oh, here's how you set up the game. And, you know, early on in anybody's career, you do, there's a lot of mimicry. And so for me, though, it took a while to figure out what exactly I wanted to do. Uh, but for me, it, it is a very particular thing that I want to do based on kind of a personal philosophy of what criticism should be. And so that's how that's how I began is just sort of as a as a fun side hobby. And, and actually, that, I mean, for me, that's kind of how I began. Also, I was seeing, you know, I got into board games. I saw the big reviewers out there. I saw all the names, you know, everyone's heard of, at least the people in the hobby, not everyone, because we're still pretty niche hobby. And, and I wasn't seeing the reviews that I was seeing when I was looking at film because it one point in college, I was considering going into film criticism and for a couple of years, I was really deep into that Yeah, as a kind of a, just a, a intellectual curiosity. And I wasn't seeing anyone even attempting to do what even, not even like the super in-depth academic film criticism. I wasn't seeing anyone attempting to be like Roger Ebert, like someone who super knowledgeable, but a great writer and very good at communicating ideas about about movies and so uh, i figured i could jump in there and of course since then i have found people who are doing that including you and and other people but it wasn't on the forefront for you you said it's more about your philosophy of criticism is that a stylistic philosophy because for me it was a lot of stylistic like i wasn't seeing a lot of writing i was seeing mostly video And I was Mm, also seeing them dominated by rules explanations rather than actual discussion of what the game experience was like. Is it similar for you? Is it a stylistic thing or is it it something else? 
Um, I think it's a bit two pronged. So if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, I would say that there is that stylistic aspect where I I prefer the written medium to video just personally, and I and I 100% get why people love video. You know, it, it is so easy to see someone being enthusiastic and to share in that enthusiasm. Um, it's infectious. You know, we, our brains are wired to, when we see someone being enthusiastic, it makes us enthusiastic, right? You see someone sad, you get sad. You see someone happy, you get happy. Um, but for me, that actually can be very limiting for one. What if I don't want to talk about board games only in kind of this visual range to me, one of the advantages of writing is that you can, you can meditate upon it at your own pace. You can return to sections if you want. It's a little easier, I feel, to agree with a portion and disagree with something else. There's a little more room for nuance. And not only that, I tend to read a little faster. So there's some part of me where I don't want to watch a two-hour video if I can read the same thing in 40 minutes. So absolutely, there was that stylistic aspect for me but also just in terms of what criticism should be, which for me relates to what this thing is that we're actually discussing. What is a board game? And to me, it seemed that pretty much everyone was approaching a board game as something that A, was a commercial product, which it is, and that's inescapable. And B, was gauged basically along uh, a spectrum of fun. And not only fun, which I don't like that word fun very much, but fun as a very particular sort of spectrum. Uh, And if you tip off either end of this spectrum, then it doesn't, it's no longer fun, even though you, the player, might have enjoyed your engagement with this thing. And so for me, it was this two pronged philosophy that, first of all, I don't like the way that we're talking about board games. And secondly, I don't think we're even talking about board games. I don't think we're even understanding what they are. Now, I think that some of that is, (laughs) I obviously didn't know all that many uh, critics, and I'm not saying this in any way to demean uh, the work of certain individuals who I had a great amount of respect for. It's just that, you know, for me, that was the focus, and it didn't seem like they were focusing on that thing. So in a way, it was very self-serving. I wanted to create the sort of things that I wanted to read. And I'm curious because I, th- I think a lot of people will be surprised. And I, I I have tried to stop using the word fun. I don't think I'm very good at not using the word fun. Uh, but I think I, I, I've, I've realized how kind of insufficient that word can be. When you say you're, you're, you're moving away from this idea that games should be fun, what are you moving towards then? How would you describe like alternatives of what would make a game interesting to you? So that's a great question. You're really putting me on the spot. So for me, I, so let's just ask the question, what is fun? You know, I, I think that when we say fun, that can conjure such a range of things that if, if we're going to that first idea you proposed of a, of a sort of stylistic limitation, what is it? It's just such a broad word. It, it's like me saying that something's good. Any number of things can be good. That's still, it, it's, Almost everybody I meet on the street is going to say, I'm a good person. You know, what does it mean to be good? What are we getting into? What are we peeling apart? So on the stylistic side, I I wish that we would discuss fun. Just let's use a, let's use better adjectives, right? We can say is something interesting. Is it innovative? Is it novel? Is it iterative? There are so many ways that we can talk about fun that aren't limited to this broad kind of meaningless term. I mean, to give to give a parallel. So, so fun is one of what I call my critical swear words, where I have a I have a little notebook with a few of them, and and another one is problematic. Whenever I see someone say this is problematic, you know, a lot of the time I agree, right? I I know what's going on, but let's say I'm walking into a situation where I don't know the actors, you know, I don't know the issue, and someone says this is problematic. Well, I'm going. Okay, but what's problem? Can't you just tell me? Was that was that extra word like? Was there a term used that was insensitive or crass, or was it simplistic, or was it not granular enough? You know, there 
cut to the protein of the meal, tell me what the issue was. And that's what I think that solid criticism and writing should be about. I, I think I feel the same way about fun. Tell me what was fun. Tell me what you enjoyed or what you didn't enjoy. So that's on the stylistic side. On the more philosophical side, I just how how am I supposed to evaluate fun? Like, for example, I recently played a board game that is actually it's not finished, so I don't want to name it. It was in prototype form, and the game was a mess. And we had a great time playing it, in part because we were making fun of it. Well, I had fun, you know, I maybe at the game's expense a little bit, and I would never want to write an article like that. That would be rude. Uh, I don't want to be that dismissive, but can't fun be that? I like for when we talk about party games, party games so often get a pass because you naturally have a fun time anytime you make your friends sit down and act like buffoons and say silly things. So you just say, well, it was fun. Okay, but was it just apples to apples with after dark terms? I mean, what was fun about it? Does that make sense or am I just. Oh, no, that makes perfect sense. And I think. Smoke out my ears. And I think. And I think trying to communicate precisely is often something that that doesn't happen. Like I, I you know, it's easy to to critique social media, but that's because of the way it is. But I see so frequently disputes and arguments where I can recognize as a third party that the real dispute is just a misunderstanding of what how a word was used and what the implications mm-hmm. of that word are. And I see very frequently words being used almost exclusively for their implication rather than any kind of precise understanding in the context where a precise understanding is, is exactly what you need. And yeah, I, I completely agree with the idea of the word fun. Again, I, I, I'm the same way. I try to, to avoid using that in my reviews. And I, if I catch myself using uh, the word fun, I, I force myself to think, okay, what it specifically uh, is it about the game that is causing me to use this word? And oftentimes, it ends up, I end up replacing it with a word that most people would probably not consider to be synonymous with fun at all, like tense or... Right. <laughs> Or yeah, sure. it made my brain hurt, <laughs> or I had a wonderful two minutes in, of silence contemplating all the possibilities the game was giving me. And so, yeah, when you explain it in that level, I, I think it not only is more precise, but it also helps the reader understand your preferences, right? So, like, I, I love games that give me, you know, headaches because I thought so in depth about the game, but I completely understand if people don't want to have that kind of experience. And so if I just went out and said, you know, Lisboa is super, super fun. You should all try it. Uh, that's not exactly particularly helpful to, to, to a lot of people because they might try it, have the same experience I had of being confronted with these very complex decisions, but come away, not enjoying it at all. Right. And so I, I think, you know, the precision of our language has to be super, super important. And in fact, I just finished writing uh, a follow-up uh, to an article I wrote late last week because I was realizing that one particular concept I was writing about based on the comments I was getting, I hadn't explained sufficiently. And so I ended up writing you know, an entirely separate uh, article to follow up on what I meant by that concept, um, which, I, which I think is valuable and, and something, yeah, you don't see a whole lot of. Moving back to kind of your beginning in uh, board game reviews, you said it was eight or nine years ago? Yeah, I think my site will be turning nine this year or maybe 10. I don't know. Yeah, I started about, I think, three years ago. And I'm curious, you, you have a much longer time frame kind of perspective on uh, this hobby and this little reviewer corner of the hobby. I'm curious... Have you seen things change a lot in those nine years uh, from your perspective? Yes. I I think that there are a lot of people who, and I I should qualify this, I think that this is a change that's happening both with those who are trying to talk about board games and those who are consuming or engaging with with those board game reviews or criticisms. And I think that that's even at the level of publishers. 
who are being very careful to consider what their board games are saying at a critical level. For example, so I'm going to give the tired example that, that I know some people are tired of it, but it's colonialism. The German Euro game tradition basically treats <laughs> guilt-free colonialism as their birthright, probably because it is kind of the European birthright, right? You take your, you take your history and you sanitize it. It makes a lot of sense. And, and fair enough, you know, you play certain American games and you kind of get the rah-rah version of American history as well. So when, when I began writing, there were very few board games that were critical of colonialism. Now, that isn't to say there weren't a few, but they tended to be niche products compared to kind of the, the big Euro game revolution, which, which, you know, in many ways, the core of it was games like Catan, which Catan is, you know, sort of the, the fantasy colonialism version of history where you get to come to this island and there's nobody there. Well, that, that's great. You know, you can, you can have all of the expansion and harvesting with none of the, the dirty aspects. And I'm not saying that as some big indictment of the industry. In a way, it's an indictment more of those people who were playing and discussing the games, because I, I'm a firm believer that one of the things that pushes any art form forward is its criticism. And historically, this has been true. You know, when you go and you read poetics, uh, it's easy to forget that you are reading an ancient book of criticism of theater and oration, of storytelling, um, that this isn't just meant to say, you know, here's what works and here does, here's what doesn't. It's not saying that only as an authority. It's saying that specifically to critique period pieces that, you know, people like Aristotle we're, we're contemplating. And so, and you see this across multiple cultures, whether it's dance or opera or, or nowadays film, that it's through the act of criticism that that's one of the things that pushes a medium forward. So nowadays though, you've got designers who are being very conscious of what is our game saying about this complex topic. And I think in part, that's because they want to have their games be part of an ongoing dialogue to be a sentence in a discourse about, you know, what are these games and what is this tradition and what is it saying when it omits certain things? And that's very exciting. And that was not so much the case, or at least not in the core of the hobby, even seven years ago. And now it is. Some, sometimes it's so much at the core of the hobby that we overcorrect, which is, which is exciting and vibrant. You know, you'll have people who look at a game by Cole Worley and say, oh, it's another colonizer game and are and they're totally missing out that. Well, no, this is this is a game that's meant to be based on, you know, the works of someone like Edward Said. And it's very much engaging with this topic at the level you should you should be encouraging. You should want this. But we've corrected that dialogue so far to the other side that it is uh, at times simplistic in the other way. But that's exciting. So I think that there has been a change. But like anything, I think sometimes the change is slow. I think sometimes people struggle against that, which is fine. That's also part of discourse. I, I'm glad you have a, you have an optimistic view then that that it's it's going for the better. And I hadn't actually considered for some reason hadn't considered specifically like like the games we now see that are that are grappling with uh, colonialism and board games as something reacting to criticism. Although now it's it's quite obvious. The hang-up I always see with people's perspective when you say, well, I, I wrote you know, this piece of criticism or, or I'm a critic, is that I feel like the idea of what a critic does is oftentimes very misunderstood in that a lo I think a lot of people think that a critic has this perspective that they are the ones decreeing what is good and bad taste and how you should enjoy <laughs> things. And for me, I'm like, no, I want to discuss with you, right? I want, I want what I wrote to start a conversation. Hopefully that's good and interesting. Everyone benefits from it because a great conversation, you know, both parties benefit. It's not one side decreeing to the other, uh, what the other side ought to do. Ha have you seen over, over your time doing this in any change in that or improvement or, or negatively uh because man sometimes i look at these like not necessarily in board games but you see these uh these movie 
critic sites that are like just pointing out continuity errors or <laughs> have this super sarcastic, you know, oh man, we're going to beat down this movie now. We're going to eviscerate this film. And right, like, right, really, right. that's 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 what's super popular right now. It's that. <laughs> Yes, and it, it's unfortunate that when I see that, I, I kind of bemoan the death of uh, film criticism, even at the same time that I'm very encouraged about board game criticism. I think that, you know, one of the things, I'll put it this way, I think we're still learning how to use the internet. <laughs> we aren't built for the internet. It was built for us, but in a way, it's gotten away from us already. You've got to feed that algorithm. Which is so unfortunate because out, out the algorithm is there pretty much to take advantage of you being upset. It's not there to comfort you, and so though it so it is unfortunate that that kind of uh, let's engage this way by making you upset or perturbed or pointing out everything that's wrong. I mean, that's what gets you your hackles up. That's what makes you click things. I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like you know there nowadays we have so much media literacy compared to any time in human history. And it's tempting to think of ourselves as these, you know, very intelligent postmodern humans, except maybe I'm the outlier here, but I feel like I'm just like the same dummy as everybody else. Because whenever I see something that's like, here's 19 reasons why, you know, Christopher Nolan's, what was that movie about the boats? <laughs> you know? Oh, uh, Dunkirk. Yeah, Dunkirk. Here's 19 reasons why Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk is actually about a spy. You know, I, I'm, I, I go, no, you're, you're wrong. I got to see these reasons so I can punch you with my words. And, and, and that's how I react. So I'm, you know, for all of our media literacy, we're still reacting to the same urges that we always have that we want to get in there. We want to wrestle. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, and honestly, I found that like, Again, going back to, to to movies is actually I think I, I read and, and consume more film criticism still than I do board game criticism. Like some of the some of the best stuff on film criticism has you know titles their videos or articles that way. Um, yeah. One of my one of my favorite movie critics writes for Vox, and they have a very specific way in which they uh, in which they name they they title their articles. Uh, there's uh, Cineflix, I think, does really good stuff, and they uh, have you know top ten establishing shots. You know, like in right. their video, which honestly, like the whole numbering thing. This is a side note, but the whole numbering thing, I never really had a problem with because I'm like. That's 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 just paragraphs. Like, yeah, just you put a number in front of it. Like, you're, that's so you're supposed to write anyways. You're you're very good at outlining. <laughs> yeah, like I was taught you you have a thesis and then you have multiple ways to support that thesis and you know that and this is just a five you're paragraph just, essay. You're just counting like you're just counting your paragraphs there. But you're right. Yeah, yeah, it, it is engaging. Like it is it is something you want to click on and, and I'm, I'm certainly not above that well but and I, here's I an example like my, that oh go ahead do you do you hate red letter media what do you mean by that so you know red letter media the uh they, they do kind of film stuff and talk about like uh i'm trying to i know you, i've heard the name they have um so for example they tend to be pretty critical uh in the negative sense and um i i don't watch videos as i've said but i i had watched like the new Star Wars, okay? Now, if anyone knows anything about me, I don't really care about Star Wars. I don't get Star Wars. I'm with Freddie Mercury on this one. And um, and honestly, I'm happy to be aligned with Freddie Mercury on something. So bite us. So every, every time a Star Wars comes out, my family has to make this pilgrimage to go see the Star Wars and they just buy me tickets. So even though I say, oh, I don't want to see it. Last time I just got mad. I end up seeing every star. I have seen every star Wars thing. And so we went to this last star Wars and it was just this, you know, this abomination. And I can't imagine how this thing was made except to me, I'm going, well, I've liked it less and less with every single movie. So I guess I know how it got here. And then I see this video just deconstructing star Wars by red letter media and even though I never watch videos, I click that and then I watch it for like two straight hours, just nodding and being like, yeah, yeah, I feel the hate. And, you know, I, so it is engaging. Oh, sure. I think what disturbs me more isn't isn't necessarily like the 
internet tactics, right? The the ways that, that the internet is discovered to tap into kind of this raw psychological effect to get you to click on things. It's yeah. for me it's two things. One is and they're kind of I suppose they're kind of interrelated. One is this idea that the extent of criticism is pointing out continuity errors or in the board game form, right? Uh, typos in the rule book, or this should have been a miniature, not a standee, or I didn't feel like uh, there were, th- there was enough replayability in the game. The end. Um, yeah. It's that kind of like straight shallowness that doesn't get into the actual experience of the game. I, I guess unless someone honestly, that's how they approach everything, then sure, I guess write about it. It's it's that <laughs> and this idea that critics are just these big bullies, we should ignore them and just and just, you know, everyone has the right to consume and play whatever they want, which is true, but I still want to talk about it, right? Like yeah, like right. that's the part I feel like a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, when I when I write about board games, like I'm trying to talk about it with you. And maybe if you read it and find it interesting, you'll talk about it with me and and maybe we'll both learn something. And it's not from a perspective of, oh man, I'm I I woke up this morning, I just wanted to trash a garbage game, so here we go. Yeah. Is it, does that make sense as a distinction? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in one sense, I feel like maybe jiving a little bit with what you're talking about is that we're in this in this medium, we are still incredibly young um, to the point that we don't yet have like critical movements. And what I mean by that is we're still defining what what is criticism? What is critique in this field uh, to separate it from, say, a consumer guide review? or from a preview, or from a how-to-play video, you know, what, what's advertising and what isn't? Uh, what's evaluation and what type of evaluation? So what, what I'm really excited for is I think that we are beginning, and, and I, I, maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I think we are beginning to see the first glimmers of having actual philosophical differences in terms of critique in this field. For example, if you look at something like literature, you can have a critic who an entire body of criticism that's about aesthetic, and you can have an entire body of criticism about taste, and you can have an entire body of criticism about conscience. And and these are all useful functions of a of a body culture. You know, just like your own body, you have a sense for aesthetic and you have taste and you have conscience, you have all of these things. But I think that the culture operates best when it also has these things in tension. And sometimes they disagree because sometimes you like sugary food and sometimes you like refined food and sometimes you like subtle and sometimes you like overt. And to me, that's what's, that's when things really get dynamic and exciting when you can have this discourse that's striking out in different directions. And sometimes uh, having alliances of opportunity and disagreements. I think we're beginning to see that. And I think that one of the places that we saw that was that for a brief moment, and I'm glad that this is reconciled, but we had sort of this delineation between this this nebulous idea of the Euro game and the Ameritrash game. And suddenly there was this philosophical difference and people were taking sides. And I think that was actually really beneficial even though it's a simplistic, dumb distinction, and in a way, and in a big way, it's reconciled itself because now you, everyone's trying to be hybrid. Now, you know, you play tons of war games that are basically Euro games. They've internalized, you know, area control and all of these other little things that Euro games introduced. But I think it was really useful for people to sit down and think about the definitions and parameters of one game versus another, and not only as a format. But, but the aesthetic of them and the feel of them. And I hope we keep doing that. I hope we keep having those arguments and those schisms. Yeah, and, and this is looking too far ahead. One thing that I've always found troubling in, troubling might be too hard of a word, but that I've not liked in areas where there's a very long history of criticism. So we'll say the literature is that it seems to me like it gets over-specialized, right? Where you have the feminist literature studies over here, and you have the Foucault specialists, and you have 
the I, I don't know. You, you have all these different specialists who are kind of all operating in their own little bubbles and create their own language and don't seem to interact very much with each other Mm -hmm. or more critically, I think, look at the idea of literature in a holistic way. It becomes really digging into these very specific areas of critique and never coming out and saying, okay, what, what, what have we learned here? Do you see that as a, as a concern? And I, I don't think it's it's clearly not an immediate concern in board games, but it, but assuming you know twenty years down the road, right? We've gotten to where that's starting to become a thing in 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 board games. It, does that idea of like over specialization in criticism concern you? I think it's a definite pitfall. So one example from my education is that I remember when I was getting my history degree. I decided that I wanted to spend some time on the on the more literary side. And now the at the university I went to, they had two big buildings. One was for <laughs> one was for the whole history department. It was this brand new building, and the other one was for kind of that's where like communications and literature still still met. So I went down the hill and I met with them, and I couldn't understand what they were talking about because it, this question came to, came up where which is bigger, a society or a culture? And in history, we had always talked about that a culture consists of many small societies, but in their vernacular, a society consisted of many small, small cultures. So when, they, when they're using kind of this, you know, they're blitzing through these ideas very quickly and saying culture and society and all of these ideas are just smacking me in the face. And I'm going, wait, 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 wait. But that can't be part of that because it's, that's, that's the wrong way around. And it turns out that they actually, the, dia, the, the vocabulary for these two groups had diverged so much so that it couldn't even interface. It was like trying to use a USB on a you know, HDMI port or something. Kind of, you know, kind of the same rough shape, but they're not really fitting. And that's when I learned, actually, that there are people whose entire uh, field of study was basically just learning to be interdisciplinarians so that they could learn how to talk uh, in a more holistic manner, as you're pointing out. So, yeah, I, I do think that that's a that's a pitfall. And I think that that is kind of going to be the next generation of board game critics problem to deal with. I hope I'm still around because that sounds exciting to interface with. But I don't, I don't know how to avoid that. I feel like that happens in, in every field, whether you're talking about, you know, medicine or sociology, that specialization is necessary and useful, but also just, it, it also tends to breed a certain insularity. Do you have any thoughts on how to get away from that, Mark? Well, I, I think, I think there's a, a distinction you can draw between hard sciences and social sciences in whether or not that's particularly troubling because clearly there are situations in which uh say in medicine or or any kind of scientific field where there's a level of specialization that is reached where different important people can't communicate or have miscommunications with each other that are super important and, and hard to resolve i think that is an easier thing to solve because it's just figuring out a shared level of communication I think it's much harder in the liberal arts slash social sciences because it ultimately goes back to the question of not how do we just achieve communication, but how do we resolve value systems? And maybe, you know, my background academically was that I went to school to study economics. I ended up changing my major to philosophy, and then I ended up not finishing the degree. And so I I sat (laughs) <laughs> and and also the philosophy and economic departments at my college didn't particularly like each other, which was which was fun and interesting. It's always helpful. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I even I, I took a class where we studied a book uh, arguing that philosophy should be the glue that holds kind of all the disciplines together and should be the the kind of uniting area of study, which eh, it was was fairly persuasive. But ultimately, right, if you have like the feminist critique of a book and then the Marxist critique of a book and then whatever other critique of a book. The problem isn't just like the words they're using in the communication. It's that they're approaching it from a wholly separate idea of value of 
of what is important to study and consider. And then as soon as you try to pull back out of your specialization and then communicate that, it's not just the language, it's that you have completely different fundamental assumptions about about criticism and about literature and about the world at large. So it's not just communication, it's the ideas themselves are then incompatible or at least clashing in some way. And that's much, much more difficult to resolve, right? Because like if two physicist specialists are having trouble communicating with each other, right, they still are going to agree on the basic principles of physics that everyone knows and understands, right? They're, they're still going to understand... I, I, I shouldn't have even tried to bring up an example. It's been so long before. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to think of like the simplest physics equation, but I've forgotten. Uh, speed of light. Was. Yeah, sure. The speed of light. They may not be able to communicate in, in other things, but they're, they're both going to understand the same idea what the speed of light is. I, I think in softer fields, it's much, much more fundamental and becomes a much, much bigger problem as a result. I think that that's generally true. I think that I think that the hard sciences often overestimate that unfortunately especially once it comes to public interfacing you know i think unfortunately we just got a crash course in differing perceptions on public health even from very expert people but i hope i hope that one of the things that we can do is and this is something that i have been trying to do a little bit is develop at least a shared critical language the problem is is that I've, I've basically reached the point where I'm using my critical language, and I think my readers understand it. But, man, we use some dumb terms in this hobby, don't we? Um, I know you recently <laughs> wrote a piece, which I enjoyed quite a bit, on uh, macro and micro theming. And, uh, I, and I think that's the sort of discussion that we need to have more of, because when we talk about a game's theme, and we're using the word theme in a way that no artistic medium uses, and the defense is, well, theme parks use it that way. I think that betrays a lot of our assumptions about what a board game can be. I mean, even, even a simple question like, is our board games art? You know, even if we were to ask five people that question, even if they all said yes, I think they would be speaking to something very different. And so I think that right now, one of the tasks of any would-be critic is you need, we need to be defining our terms. It's not enough to say a game is art. And and to be clear, this is like the game is art argument. I tend to be on the side that, well, I appreciate what you mean when you say games are art. I actually don't think games are art, but I totally sympathize with and agree with what you mean when you say that. And so I'm going to go with right, it. Right, because, because often when people say games are art, what they're actually trying to say is, I think games are super important. Right. Right. And we have this imaginary threshold that once something is art, then it counts. And when Roger Ebert says a video game can never be art, that that means he thinks that it's less than. And he did. You know, he did think games were dorky and he hadn't played any video games and he was uninterested in revising his views. And that's fine. He's not a video game critic. And to me, video game uh, board games are incredibly important. I think they have inc- breathtaking potential. But in terms of defining it as art, I actually, I, I kind of don't think it is. But if you were to sit me down in a, in a, in a conversation circle and say, are board games art? I'd just be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because of the, uh, the secret thing that we're talking about and kind of agreeing on without overtly agreeing on it. Yeah. Whereas I always just be like, it depends on your definition of art, <laughs> right? Like, like that's the real question, right? Is X art? Well, okay. The real question you're asking here is what is art? And that's a very complicated question or a very simple question. And it's nothing in between, right? Like it's either, right. okay, I have determined that art means this, or let's consult a dictionary and go with that. Or it becomes a much, much, much more complicated question. Yeah. I, I'm fine with either one of those, but the one in between, it, I don't think it really exists, right? The casual conversation. So you can't tell me right now, Mark, what you think art is? You can't casually I, just no, drop it. I, I no, not at all. <laughs> that, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I've thought about trying to figure it out, and I actually have purchased some books like on the philosophy of aesthetics, and I just haven't read them. Like they're in my pile to read, but like, <laughs> right? Like when I thought about, man, maybe I should try to write this out because sometimes you know I, I start writing something and I figure out what I was 
actually trying to say as I write it. And I, I did that once with like, you know, what like our board games art. And I'm like, no, I, I got to start. I, I got to read. I got to read books before I can even approach this. Right. And, and I, and I love your attempt to create a shared language, which is always tricky because you don't want to like be the language dictator, but yes. And, and I am a language educating why right. you ought to yeah. use certain words in certain ways because it's, it's it helps communicate things better uh is is i think i think a worthy task it's funny too i i think that some people don't realize that the way that they talk about that is a little contradictory because for example i argued that you know and and i'm not the first person to argue this uh michael barnes has argued it as well that we really need to be more careful in using the word theme and um and of course, someone comes along and they're like, well, well, meanings change. So you can't call it that. I'm like, well, part of being a linguistic descriptivist is proposing new definitions. You're the one who's saying I can't use a word. I mean, I'm not I'm not forcing anybody to do anything. I'm saying this is what I'm this is how I'm going to talk about the word theme. I'm going to talk about setting. I'm going to talk about some other terms that literally is language changing you're free to use it or not. Right. Yeah. But it, it's, and it's, and it's the argument, the argument and the discussion for using that word in that way. That is the, that is the, the benefit, right? It, it's, it's analyzing our preconceptions about how we're using language in, in, in a deeper way and in understanding and perhaps changing as a result. That is the benefit. It's not just the, okay, we should use this word now. Right. right. It's, it's it's the warrant uh, of it, not not just the claim to use the words I try to pound into my debate students heads. <laughs> oh, and, and going back to uh, kind of the phrases or, or the words that you proposed as I was writing that piece on micro and macro theme, uh, which is kind of uh, words I came up with, I, I think I don't think I read them somewhere, I became more and more convinced that your use of the word feedback as a separate idea was actually quite good. So I'll probably end up using that more frequently going forward. Yeah, it's interesting I, because I didn't actually, I wasn't completely sold on your usage of that word when I read your article, but it was only when I kind of thought through similar ideas myself. That I'm like, oh yeah, th having that thing be a separate word uh, makes sense now. Yeah. And it's one of those where I'm, you know, I, and I think this is what you were talking about earlier with this idea that we're all engaged in the dialogue. You know, I'm not 100% sold on it. If, if somebody has a, a framework for talking about games that I, I think is uh, more compelling, I am happy to switch. Hopefully the framework that I'm using will, will do exactly that, that it will spur some thoughts and hopefully it will develop whether through me or through somebody else, I don't think it matters. I, I just hope it develops a more solid vocabulary that we can, that we can share and use to speak about this stuff. Because frankly, theme is just inadequate <laughs> right now. Yeah. Um, well, I, I got really excited in that piece I was writing when I realized, Oh, wait a minute. If, if you know, the parallels, if you ask someone what the theme of star Wars is, they'd say star Wars. Right. If, <laughs> right. if everyone spoke of theme as the in the same way that, that it's commonly used in the board game uh, community, it's like, no, the theme of Star Wars is not Star Wars. But they might say the theme of Star Wars Rebellion is Star Wars, which to me is the same exact problem. Like you haven't actually said much. Sure. Yeah. And I keep coming back to this idea that it's the discussion, the resulting the discussion is the truly valuable part because like. I, I had, oh, I, I'm not even going to guess how long ago it was because time has gotten weird. I spoke with Isaac Shalev about his his and uh, Jeff Engelstein's book on board game mechanisms where they try to do a similar thing. They, right, they try to create a, like, okay, here's the words we're using for this idea. Please go along with it. Maybe we'll we'll start talking you know, right, using the right. same words, you know, uh, but it's, it's a tricky conundrum when you're proposing words that people use, but you don't want to be a prescriptivist about it. You're just saying like here for ease, for ease of communication, please let's use this or something else, propose something else that's better. And we can go with that instead, but we should have a word to describe this because I, I see in board games, 
kind of the deterioration of the meaning of words happening, even in my relatively short time really in the board game community. Like the idea of what worker placement is, Mm -hmm. I've seen people use the phrase worker placement when they mean Euro game, Mm -hmm. they mean engine builder. Like it's just, it's been used so many times that it's become a shorthand for this kind of look of a game, right? If it's got farms or resources on a, on hexagons, right? It's a worker placement game. Uh, yeah. Not even considering like, what what does it mean to place workers? You know, of course, how do you distinguish that from uh, action selection where you just have a token to indicate what action you chose, but it doesn't block anything, right? And so, you know, I don't, see any fault in that it's just to me it's almost a curiosity like wow that's interesting how that phrase has shifted in that person's mind or it shifted somewhere and then gotten into that person's mind where they've now uh, used that phrase to mean euro game yeah now one that stands out to me is deck builder you know when when you talk about deck builder and people i love magic well, okay. That one's even more complicated because magic was the inspiration yeah, ma- for Dominion. <laughs> ma- magic has been around first, and now we've kind of usurped this term to mean a game about building the deck. And they're like, well, isn't magic about building your deck more than the actual game? No, yes, but uh, 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 but magic sucks. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a that's a, that's a weird. One. And, and honestly, the imperfections make, to me, like make language interesting. Like people talk in, you know, English is this kind of <clears throat> thrown together language right. uh, from so many different places. And I remember a friend once argued to me that it would be so much better if we just used a deliberately constructed language. And I thought, oh. like, no, 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 no. You just, you lose so much. You know, no one, no one who works in aesthetics or style believes that that's yeah. such an, that's such a thing that these, like, I, I want a language full of weird implication when you say a word, that's the fun stuff. So, I mean, just like the other day I was, someone persuaded me, I had to watch this, this weird show about ancient times and someone used the phrase clockwork. And I was going, did they have clockwork in the year 30? I don't think so. I don't think so. And it totally took me out of it because I approach everything like a historian. But I was just thinking about the texture of that, that when he says, you know, their guards were there like clockwork, we immediately know what it means, even though it has nothing to do with clocks. Here we are using it in a context before clocks exist. You know, there's no there's no machinery to speak of and and rather and, and it was jarring. It was anachronistic, but it also was just kind of a little tickle. You know, it was this little fun tickle of language that whoever was writing this show couldn't even see past the way that he's come to use this term. And that's kind of the fun stuff about writing. That's the stuff I like. So I, I don't want to be doing lodge ban or esperanto or what boring languages for sure yeah i want to pivot a little bit and talk to you about history because that's your kind of field of study from what i understand or you mentioned it before and board games clearly have this corner right that is that is specifically about engaging history often Mm -hmm. called war games but really i that whole tradition is all about just kind of simulating aspects of history, even though most of the games end up being about war. But, you know, that that kind of corner, it seems to maybe maybe it's a recent thing, but but engaging in different aspects of understanding history more broadly outside of war as well. What value do you see in board games engaging in historical simulation or even like historical argument of Here's what I think this era or this situation was about in game form, this kind of system form. So I think the easiest answer is actually an illustration. So I have a, I have a great friend, a uh, dear friend named Jeff, who um, is very, I don't know how to phrase this because I don't want to be dismissive, 
So he's very he's very traditional in his interpretation of American history, which in this case means that he he tends to think that the Constitution had one intended meaning instead of many meanings intention. You know, colonialism. Yeah, there was some bad stuff, but by and large, it was good. Something like the the British colonizing India that that was done benevolently. So he has this very traditional view of history, and. We were playing very just very recently to invoke Cole Worley again. We were playing the second edition of John Company, and we we had somebody new with us who had never played it before, and of course, like you might expect, was a little deer in the headlights at all of these ideas and systems and everything in tension. Now we finished the game, and this person, we you know, after every game, we sit and we discuss it a little bit. And so this newcomer was going, yeah, that was, that was really interesting. And then my friend Jeff turns and he goes, you can, this game, so you can see why this company, despite touching half of the world's trade, was never really profitable and was always being bailed out and was really bad for the people of India. And he's basically saying all of this very literate historical stuff <laughs> because he played the game. And it's true that we've talked about it as we've played it, and he's played the first edition, and he's not a stranger to it. And it's true that this isn't operating on its own. I think that if anyone thinks that a war game should replace, like, text, of course, that's wacky. That's not... But but who's saying that? I, I think that historical games are wonderful at teaching history. Now, I think that with anything that you know, there's all the study of historiography is hard, right? The study of what are the limits of history to someone who's a lay person, they, you might read a history book and think, well, this is how it happened. As opposed to someone who's really studying that period as a historian, where you read a ton of sources and you realize you're basically telling a story that you think fills in the blanks and accounts for those different primary sources, biases and, and et cetera that it's a hard process. The same thing happens with games where it's very easy without support to play a game and just go, well, okay, so this is how it happened. But as a supporting text, properly supported with with other research, I think board games do a magnificent job of making historical arguments. Now, one example that I love is just how many people know certain aspects of, of geography because they played Risk. Because once you sit and not just have a map there, but are forced to interact with it, you must learn it. And you're learning it in an environment where you're incentivized to learn it. Uh, this, the same is true of other board games. And I think there's so much good work going on right now where games are making very incisive points, even being used as agitprop almost. Oh, man. I, I, so I think games are doing great in that aspect. I think they could be doing better on the whole, but I think they're headed in a good direction. What discourages me is that I do see some people saying, no, games can't teach history, which is unfortunate. Uh, I think that's a very limited view of what games can or cannot accomplish. What do you think, Mark? I don't know what I think. I think I, I like historical war games, I think almost because I I'm not particularly well read in history. Like I, I didn't mm-hmm. study history specifically, so I have a general someone who finished some college understanding of history that's diluted over time because I haven't continued to read lots of history since then. And so I I enjoy historical games, but I never know if they're for sure if they're accurately representing the history, right? Mm-hmm. So I have this this uh, layer of, of skepticism of, well, I think, it, you know, this makes an interesting point here about how this, this, these incentives were set up and maybe someday I'll look into a book about this and see if that was actually the case or how, you know, what maybe did the designer put some kind of spin on it or they have in a unique interpretation. However, I think, and this goes back to uh, my study of economics is that board games, deal in incentives right so Mm -hmm. it's all about incentives and in choice and consequence and insofar as games can set up these kind of incentive structures and systems if they 
are accurate to the history, I think can be kind of particularly incisive about that portion of history, because it's not just reading, you know, this person decided to do this and here's uh, the context, but it's putting you in the position where that's maybe the choice you also made in a similar situation playing that person or playing that government. And so I think potentially a game has a, has a great ability to really teach about different aspects of history. I just don't have the knowledge to actually know if a game's doing it well or not, uh, right. even though I find it fun. So then it's like, well, th that's a huge limitation because, you know, there's a lot of people like me who aren't particularly well read on history and having just kind of a good solid general understanding from basic schooling. And, and in that sense, how much are the games actually teaching? Or I guess in that sense, it's really a burden on the designers to be super rigorous um, and make sure that they're being accurate and that they're studying, you know, the right text and all that. Right. And I think it behooves any would be designer who wants to make, who wants to use history as an argument in a board game uh, first of all, it's useful to put some of that rhetoric right into the text. You know, tell us what your game is. <laughs> I, am, I am a huge supporter of not making people who want to play your game have to hunt for any paratext. You know, put it, put it in the rule book. Say in your intro what the game is about. Um, say what, put in some notes in the back, especially in a historical game, what you're trying to model. Flavor text. I'm usually anti-flavor text, but that's usually for fantasy games where it's like, and then a venomous, bilious spider. And I'm like, okay, I know spiders are gross. You don't have to use more adjectives. It's, it's a scary spider. But for a historical game, it's, used to have a, it's useful to have a couple little notes on who was this person? What is he doing? So I'm a big supporter of that. The other thing I'm a supporter of is games in aggregate. So sort of this idea that one of the things that's frustrating with colonial games isn't the issue that, you know, I, I, I like I'm not mad at Catan, right? I, I bear no ill will toward Catan, nor do I really am I really upset at any individual game. You know, I, I don't go and play Catan and I'm like, oh, there's no they've whitewashed it. No, the, the issue isn't any individual title. The issue is that in aggregate over many dozens and hundreds of titles that it becomes assumed that it be, that, that there's chalk outlines where there were once people that natives are erased, that atrocities become caught, you know, become the, the, the building of a structure. And you don't see any of the texture that makes that topic what it is. So that's where I think that we need to be a little more cautious. And this is one of the things that I think criticism can actually help quite a bit with is, you know, first of all, I want to avoid being a dour, joyless scold. You know, it, I've played some board games that are about colonialism, and I think they're great. And I'm still going to talk about them as though they're great. I'm still probably going to also throw in there that, you know, I, I, I don't know why this particular game was about this, you know, why, why, why this? Yeah. I, I had that exact critique on the game uh, Crusaders. I don't know if you played that one. Yes, I did. And, and, and that's a good example where, so I played it and I actually maybe had a very different reaction where, where, so I was going, first of all, if you're going to crusade, yeah, the traditional ex expectation is you should go to the Holy Land. There's also the part of me that's going, well, those weren't the only crusades, you know, the Lithuanians sure didn't like being crusaded against and the Poles didn't like it. And, you know, it, there's this huge range of people who were crusaded against who were not in the so-called Holy Land. But is this game expressing that or not? The, the game seemed to be unintentionally making a good point, which I'm not actually convinced is a good point. For me, um, I'm like the game is so abstracted from the concept of the Crusades that why couldn't have just been something else, right? It, you could be you could be building merchant guilds. I mean, it, yeah. yeah, it's it, it was going it was going for the appeal of you know cru a crusade has sort of this exoticism and this we're going to go and have an adventure. It was going for that, and any point that it made non deliberately was still non deliberate. 
and it was so obscured because nowhere in the rule book does it talk about crusading, you know, so, so it becomes too muddy. So that's where I think criticism is actually very useful that we can pick into that and discuss it and bring different people who have different perspectives on what is crusading history. You know, what was happening here, you know, your opinion and my opinion and someone like Efka, who, you know, comes from a country that was the recipient of crusades that weren't in the Holy Land, we're going to have different takes on that. And as critics, we should be excited about that possibility that we are going to offer different perspectives and learn and expand our own base of knowledge. That's the, that's what we're here to do. So, yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, I'm curious what you see because because board games are necessarily abstracted. They have to be. And again, going back to my background, and, and I'm going to end up probably writing an article about this pretty soon, but when board games try to simulate economic principles, you know, entrepreneurship or, or trading or, or just, you know, yeah, just growing economies or building up uh, a business or something like that, which, you know, is kind of like the basis of what a Euro game is. It's yeah. about building, not destroying. Um, so a lot of them have these kind of businessy themes. And that's really cool, but I think there's there's two fundamental challenges that skew away from economic knowledge that board games, almost all board games, fall victim to. And that's what I call the problem of, of the single winner and the problem of the game ending, right? Because mm-hmm. in real life... If you have a business, right, you define what the success is for that business, right? Clearly going out of business is probably your fail state. Uh, but like if someone wants to own a shop in a small town and they have no aspirations to grow that into a huge enterprise and they live their life owning that shop and that's successful and they can feed their family and they have a great life, that person isn't simulated in these economic games. It's only the person who really, really wants to grow and expand uh, forever and ever. And then even within that subset of person, right, there's this one winner problem. You have a single winner at the end of the game, even if everyone's business has grown 10 times, which doesn't really track. And I don't think, you know, you can say a lot of bad things about super successful business people, but I don't think most of them really want everyone else to fail they just want to become rich. You know, I'm sure a few do, but in the context of the game, if there's a single winner and you're trying to beat everyone else and not just maximize your own growth, that becomes weird uh, to me. And then also the fact that the game ends, right? In real life, business people are planning beyond their own lifetimes, right? They're planning to pass things on to other people and they're not thinking about like this discrete endpoint and then that skews incentives right because you have in many games that shift where you go from growth to cashing in on that growth which is interesting from a gameplay perspective but doesn't simulate entrepreneurship very well and i'm wondering uh, as a historian are there aspects of the abstraction the necessary abstraction or limitations of board games that provide similar challenges for those trying to do historical simulation I would say yes. And I, and it's a, it's a qualified yes though. So first of all, you know, I, I, I completely agree that, you know, when you play food chain magnate, it's not just a case of shutting down all the other Arby's it's that you might not even want to be running Arby's. You might want to be running subway and have a bunch of like shops that can't even cook. Right. Like your business model might be so different that it, it, it doesn't even intersect. This is one of the reasons why battles are so popular <laughs> because battles are very easy to model incentives because battles do begin and end. You know, there's a point at which the armies are no longer there hitting each other. And generally we know what the incentives are like high ground is usually pretty good. Not getting hit is usually pretty good. Hitting really hard is usually pretty good. So, you know, you can, you can put in very basic ideas like, okay, if you're on top of a hill, you get a plus one. You know, if your cavalry charges X spaces, you get a plus two. It's very easy to model incentives like that. So it gets harder once we get into kind of a broader cultural game. This is one I'm trying to think, can we, can I go without mentioning Cole (laughs) Worley? Have you played Oath? 
Unfortunately, no, I haven't yet. I, I, I will someday. I'm going to make sure of that because it looks fascinating. So I think that Oath is probably the best game ever designed on historiography. Just the idea of what is, and it, it forces you to ask questions like, what is winning? And especially when you have kind of this intergenerational multi-game thing going on where at some point you might say in a game of Oath, well, I'm not going to win and I'm not going to try to stop winning. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop trying to win. I mean, I instead, I'm going to try to make the best situation for myself going forward. And it is just such a radical shift to make if you can make it. And I, I'm not convinced anyone can. I think some people are going to find it very off-putting. It's a, it's a hard shift. Is there a th single winner at the end of Oath? There is, but... It's hard to, so one person will win Oath, but depending on who wins and how they win and who holds what when they win, all of these variables change how the next game will be set up. And so you can go into the next game in a very strong position based on how you lost the previous game. You might actually go into the next game stronger than the winner of the previous game. And it's not a legacy system, you know, you never, because none of it is preordained. You never tear anything up. There's really no narrative except what you create through the process of play and strung between multiple plays. And the reason I say it's a good game about historiography is because it's the first game that really gets you thinking about, okay, well, if I'm in this situation, if I were in ancient Rome or, you know, whatever time period I'm kind of mentally using as my lodestar for this, if I were in ancient Rome and I knew that Caesar was going to become dictator and there was nothing I could do about it, but I could do these things to prepare like my children or me for the next civil war or whatever it is, what would that be? And it gets you thinking about kind of these long-term prospects. Now, it's an incredibly ambitious game. I think in some ways it stumbles, but I hope that other designers are looking at that and thinking, well, what does this do? How does this expand the scope of a game? And not even in an RPG way where it's also individually directed, but how does this take incentives and push them past when we put the game away? And that's, I'm amazed that this game even exists to be honest. You know, when Cole was first trying to, I, I spoke with him a few years ago when he was first having the idea and he was trying to explain it to me. And he was like, oh, it's like a tableau, but like people share the tableau, but it's meant to represent the passage of history. And I was like, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this sounds like it's really going to work, Cole. Yeah. You got a great idea. And here it is. And it's, it's magnificent. And it does exactly what it sets out to do in a very off-putting and sometimes grating way. <laughs> but so games are doing that. Now, if, if I'm not allowed to talk about Cole Worley, the, the question becomes a lot harder. Do games model historical incentives well? I think they can, but I think that one of the things we have to focus on is that you have to zoom out a little bit and think about systems, like cultural systems and governments, more than thinking about individuals. I think that, for example, a corporation so I would agree with you that an individual CEO is thinking beyond himself, but we have organizations that sort of turn us into just neurons in the behavior patterns of the system. You know, like we can look at, yeah, Bezos went to space in a penis rocket and that's, you know, good for him. But, but what does Amazon do? Well, it still behaves according to some pretty predictable it slashes prices so it can murder its competition. Then it jacks those prices up. You know, it, it, it signs contracts to make ship, the back end of shipping cheaper. I mean, it still behaves in certain ways. So when we take out people, I, th I think that part of the problem is we expect that games are going to tell us something super insightful about people when we should be expecting them to tell us something insightful about societies uh, and systems and systemic problems. And that can be a lot harder because we empathize so naturally with the individual. And I think history's taught a lot with focus on the individual. It is, I know, yeah. And I know, I don't know very much about what it is, but I know there's like competing theories and there's this idea of like the great man theory of history, which from my understanding is pretty much debunked. I don't know. 
Well, and it's kind of the baseline, right? Like for for centuries, that's just been history. You write about the great dude yeah, who yeah. did a bunch of stuff. But I mean, even like so, so history, like that's what Marxist history is, right? Is thinking about, well, here are big sweeping patterns of of thesis and and counter thesis and synthesis. And how do those create social movements that then undergo revolution and reformation and then have reaction? And you have to, one of the advantages of Marxist history, and, and this is one of those loaded terms where I just know someone is going to be like, ah, oh, he's a Marxist. No, we're talking about Marxist history. Just say Hume. Which is, they won't know who yeah, you're talking which, about. <laughs> talking about Hume. Yeah, <laughs> so we're talking about history that looks at things not on a personal level, but but as a codependency, uh, we're we're talking about history as very big uh, movements that that nations and conglomerations and companies are almost organiza- they're organisms of their own accord, and people are just cells in them. And one of the goals in to Marx is to wake up the cells. Um, now, that doesn't mean that that's where Marxist history always goes. But so now you're seeing a lot more history that is trying to do that sort of thing and look at systems a little bit better. Um, I mean, so very hot topic in the news right now, of course, is critical race theory. I'm not sure why it's hot, because it's been around forever and it grows out of just critical legal theory, which is, again, kind of a historical legal framework for evaluating how laws work, the idea that all laws will be formed to support the status quo um, and critical race theory takes the next step and says, well, in America, the status quo is racial. So critical race theory begins in the seventies and critical legal theory goes back decades before that. Uh, there's nothing really radical about these ideas. And um, you know, I mean, if you ever have felt like a law is biased toward the big guy and against the little guy, then you agree. You already agree with critical legal theory. Um, if you feel like you're being screwed and that rich people get away with things, well, there you go. That's critical legal theory. But his, history is now trying to look at these big ideas. And that can be very hard when we can only really get toward those big ideas by reading individual journals and hi- historical writings. It takes a lot of work. But board games are better at that than the, talking about the individual in most cases. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I and I, and I think you know if if the best or at least a super valuable way of analyzing history is looking at systems and board games are very good at creating systems, then that's like you know that's your argument for historical board games right there. Yeah, and, and it's actually something going back to economics, right? The 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 similar branch of economics that emerges around the same time in the sixties and seventies is public choice theory, which kind of has the same view of like let's analyze people working within a bureaucracy or within a government using the same tools we analyze economic actors right systems of incentives and not people who are special in any way just because they happen to be heads of state or in a congress or in a bureaucracy right they're subject to the same kind of incentives and structures as anyone else just happens to be a government yeah i i I think board games could analyze that kind of system also. And I think sometimes they do. And actually in, in terms of if I ever design board games in the future, which I have vague aspirations for, I mean, that's the kind of thing I want to look at. I want to look at public choice theory. How can we put that into a board game? Because I think a lot of board games touch on it, but don't quite understand, haven't, haven't gone all the way in, in examining that kind of analysis of governmental action. Yeah. One and, and maybe a parallel in historical board games. So, you know, I'm sure everyone has played a civilization game, you know, so this idea of the huge scope of history. Well, one of the things that most civilization games just fail at, and this includes video digital civilization games, is that in history, a lot of stuff happens because of accident, you know, like a group of people you never heard of decided to migrate into your borders or a volcano erupts and suddenly, or the little ice age begins, you know, these things can collapse empires and change boundaries and even change value systems. And how do you put that into a civilization game 
Well, for the most part, civilization games just don't even try. And I don't think that this is something that you can't do. It's just something that no one's doing in part because they, you know, there's this model of, well, a civilization game means you just keep expanding and you keep racking up your points and you come into contention with other players. And and that's a civilization game. And so it takes a very deliberate choice to do that. So could you have a, a game about running a company, for example, how do you model, you know, you're doing all of this stuff to maximize profit. Well, then does that mean you've just created a union? Does that mean you have a whistleblower? You know, what are the inter- what are the intrusions that break the system? Every year we celebrate Labor Day because of the Pullman strike. And this is not something that was anticipated by the Pullman, you know, rail car company. But here we here we are. We have we have a, a, a 40 hour work week. We have a weekend. You know, we have all of these things that we take for granted that basically came up because individuals decided to screw the system. You know, they were sick of the system. Can you put that into the system? And I think that that is something that I hope game designers going forward start to think about. Not only how can we model systems better, but how can we model when the system and the individual run into one another? I think some games are trying to do that. The game that just came to mind for me is uh, Archipelago. Yeah, Archipelago, I think, is trying to do that. Yeah, right, because you you constantly are having these demands placed upon you from different sources uh, in between rounds of the game where you have to pay resources or you have to, uh, or you see, like, you know, the infamous, like, revolt counter goes up or something like that. Right. And that's one reason I love Archipelago as an example, even though in some ways it's a little inelegant, is just, you know, so you you have this colonial power come in and say to the natives, well, now you get to work for me. And now they're like, well, but if we're not going to get to do our thing, you need to give us more fish. <laughs> and, and it's just very true of colonial powers. And it's a very Foucauldian thought, right? This idea that, you know, the, the idea that, it's 100% culpability on the side of the imperial power. That's kind of the great man theory. Now, if you look at it and you say, well, in what way are the natives exercising power, even though in a stand-up fight, they could never win? Well, here they are. They're saying, we're not going to work <laughs> unless you give us fish. Little acts like that. Uh, that's such a wonderful example. I'm, br- I'm really happy you brought that up, Mark. Yeah, um, and, and I find you know, that that game... I think it's fascinating. I think it's absolutely a fascinating game. And I think it's because it's so, in my mind, clearly paints the players as the villains of the story. Um, yeah. And, and I, I think I'm, a lot I'm surprised of people play when... that game and don't come to that conclusion. Yeah. And, and it's a curious game because I've seen some people be like, well, this is such a bad game. And I'm going, well, eh, maybe, maybe we're bringing something to the game. I I do kind of wonder what would have happened if we, if it could be designed today and it wouldn't be the bad science fiction version, you know, would it be a little more tech? Well, so it was redesigned uh, as you probably know. Wait, was it really, was it reskinned? Yeah. And it was maybe I didn't know that. um, I reviewed it and I've already forgotten the name of it. Um, But yeah, Bollinger redesigned it. Let's see if it's, it's called um, living planet. Oh, that's right. And it just strips out everything about it that made it insightful or interesting. But if Bollinger designed Archipelago now, basically 10 years later, would he be any more textually clear about like, no, you're the jerk. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Part of me suspects if he released it now, more people would understand it, even if it was exactly the same. Right. If you. That's probably true. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to me that's fascinating. I I actually I think it's super interesting, not for every game, but to have games like that or like John Company where it's like, oh yeah, I'm the bad guy here. Um, but in doing so you understand the systems that created that situation. So it's it's not just it's this idea that the evils of history and the evils that happen in the world aren't aren't completely other right you can easily say well i wouldn't be that person but i think it's incredibly important to understand that in certain situations you would 
progress towards that person probably right well right. i think that's, that capability is within us um, yeah i think is is a very important thing to understand as humans and i think games like that can can make you understand that a little bit right well that's one of the places i think that the recent crowdfunding campaign for one of Worley's games was a little unfortunate for the people saying, well, do we want to play as colonizers? What's the value in sympathizing with coloni colonizers? And to me, that isn't the value. The value is it, if it's this easy to slip into bad behavior then, and very few people involved with it were questioning it, how easy is it for us to be culpable right now? In what ways are we being culpable? In what ways are we involved in a system that is rotten? And in what ways can you maybe try to, as an individual, affect that? You can try to be an ethical actor in capitalism. Maybe that's limited. I know a lot of people would say you can't. I don't buy that. I think we're always making little choices that in aggregate have an impact on the systems we interact with. Mm -hmm. Games can cause reflection. I remember reading an article. It was, I can't remember what, it was a pretty major publication. Maybe it was the New York Times did an article on Voco and the coin games. Mm -hmm. and it opens with the the reporter was talking about watching a group of people play um, a distant plane and at one point one of the one of the people playing the game remarked as forces are were moved into a particular area or a particular city remarked that his son was shot in that city certainly. yeah and right i recall that having moments of not just like academic understanding, but of self-reflection and bringing it back to like personal understanding of who you are uh, when playing games is something that definitely happens and maybe something games can try to tap into a little bit. Well, thank you again so much for coming on. I think this was, this was super interesting. And hopefully if, if for people listening, if you're interested in, uh, the idea of board game criticism. Now you have uh, some more thoughts and ideas from us that may inspire uh, your own writing or your own videos or something like that, or at least seeking out um, the writing that has been done already. I, I would love to have more and more people kind of join this conversation of looking at games in a critical way and, and trying to understand them. Even something simple, like you said, of like just getting to a deeper understanding of what we mean when we say theme, right? How games can, yeah. can work with that idea and that, that word. But anyways, thanks again for coming on. Thank you all for listening. And if you want to see more of Dan's stuff, it is what space slash or dash it, Biff. It's just space yeah. There's no dash it's, in it. I thought there was no, a there's dash no dash. It. There is a dash in the title, not in the URL though. Okay. Not in the URL spacebiff.com. I've always wondered is space Biff like a non de plume or is that just the name of the website? <laughs> That's it was a placeholder actually. <laughs> uh, and then I just didn't change it. So yeah, well the thoughtful gamer was the best name I could find. And I'm like, I'm not thinking any more about names. It's adequate. <laughs> And I'm never going to think about it again. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Anyways, go to spacebiff.com. Dan's writing. If you haven't read it already, it is absolutely fantastic. I love it. Uh, if you want to read more from me, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. If you want to help support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. You can find us on social media. Also, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I know, Dan, you're on Twitter at the very least. I am. Um, what, what's your Twitter handle? I think it's just at Dan Thoreau. Okay, cool. And if you would rate and review the podcast on whatever service you get the podcast from, uh, that would also be super helpful. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.